Hi, and welcome to this brief presentation about teaching Leonidas at secondary level in New Zealand. I'm going to be running you through basically what classical studies is taught at New Zealand high schools, so from sort of age 13 to around 18, what standards we cover under our national system, which is called NCEA, and how importantly I have brought in Leonidas into the first year level of that, so year 11, fifth form, 15 year olds, how we teach Leonidas, Thermopylae, and how that course runs, student reception of it, and how exciting these changes have been. As we go through, um, please keep in mind, if you want to know more, if you want to see any of my resources, if you want to hear any more about it, or if you have any questions, or if you wish to share, my email is here on this front slide. Email me at any point, and I'm more than happy to share, because as far as teaching goes, collaboration is key. So let's have a look at what we're doing down here in New Zealand. So when we look at studying classical studies in New Zealand, and by classical studies I do mean the study of classical studies and ancient history broadly, we use the term classical studies to cover all the different topics, there are quite a few different options that can be taken. Now looking at the year levels I've got noted here, these are the year level courses for my school that I currently teach at, at St Kentigan College, however not all schools are the same. Um, my school is quite different in that we have year 7 through to 13. Now I think that for other places around the world you don't have a year 13, it finishes at year 12. So imagine that basically we have from, I think some of you call it form 1 through to form 7, or basically high school and the two years prior to that we have them all on the same campus. So I'm quite lucky in that I have um, created quite a few years ago actually the Ancient Languages and Cultures course, and that is for my year 8 students. And I normally have one class of girls and one class of boys. They're separated by gender here at the moment. Um, and that works quite well because, of course, I can choose topics to suit. Now, with this course, we actually look at Year 8 at Ancient Egypt, Greece and Rome. We keep it geographical to keep it straightforward. And then with each of those ancient worlds, we look at the languages to go with them. So hieroglyphics and hieratic for Egypt, obviously ancient Greek for Greece and Latin for Rome. Um, this year, I also brought in the ancient Aztec sort of idea. Of course, they're not strictly um, ancient, one would argue, but they were an interesting comparison. And we did a little bit of Nahuatl with the class, but it's just a dabbling. Um, year 10 is sort of your 13, 14 year olds, and that's a course I bought in about four years ago. And this one's quite different. This one we look at thematically. Um, this one we look at the theme of warfare. We do a theme of entertainment. We do a theme of philosophy, myth, and religion. And we do um, a final theme, which is sort of free choice. We see where the class is going and we run with it. Um, this year, for example, we did death in the afterlife, and the class chose to make pottery. Um, of different death and afterlife scenes from around the ancient world. That's the end of sort of the options. Those year eight and year tens are two different classes that I've sort of put together. Some schools have similar and some schools don't. From there, we go into year 11 with my 15-ish year olds, my level one students. Once we get to level one, two, three, that is when we are under what's called the NCEA program. Um, which is the curriculum standards of New Zealand. So basically for any subject of which you wish to do under NCEA, you have to gain points and credits for sitting certain exams and certain papers. For level one, which we're going to be looking at, and then level two, and then level three, there's lots of different options you can look at. And for Leonidas, as we'll look at in a minute, that's the significant figure standard, which is worth credits. It's worth four credits, which goes towards a total at the end of the year. NCA is perhaps a little bit confusing to those outside New Zealand, but basically imagine that every subject a student takes has a certain number of credits or points they can gain for each of their um, internals, which are assignments in class, and each of their exams. And they need a certain number of points to pass, and the points come at different levels. They could be achieved levels, which is like, a, um, I suppose you would say, a, a C, C+. Plus. They could be a merit, which sure probably goes up towards up within the B plus range, and anything above that is an excellence, a top credit. If you have a lot of excellence credits, you can be excellence endorsed, merit endorsed, and so on and so forth. So we're going to be looking at level one classics. Now, level one classical studies is not taught in every school in New Zealand. The majority of schools teach year 12 and year 13, so level two and three, the last two years of high school, but not all of them teach classical studies. Now, there's a myriad of reasons for that. Uh, one, if I'm to be completely candid, is because of the um, 
I would say, be clashed with history. History classes can, are concerned they'll lose their numbers to classical studies. The other is that perhaps there may not be enough classically trained teachers at schools. Um, we are, of course, a unique breed in the high school realm, so we don't have as many of them. And beyond that, there has been talk of removing level one. Um, with the NZQA authority is looking at removing level one. So not all schools have it. We brought it into my school around three years ago, and just this year we've changed our significant figure standard to Leonidas, whereas most schools do a different figure. So this is basically, if we're looking at the year levels and what we do in New Zealand for classical studies, this is what happens in high school. You've got level one, two, and three for our seniors, our fifth, sixth, and seventh form, our last three years of high school. Below that, it depends on the college or school. It depends where you go and depends what the options are. Okay, so if we unpack level one just a little bit more, these are the different standards that you can choose from. Now, we don't do all the standards. That would be quite um, a mission to do all of the standards. Most schools will select four standards to cover. So for me, I choose two externals, and we look at ideas and values of the ancient world, and we look at that by reading the Odyssey at level one, and we discuss what the Odyssey teaches us about the different ideas and values, belief systems of Homeric Greece, and we look at the important figure exam is of course which is today's focus which is Leonidas and we look at how he's significant what change he brought about what he teaches us about the ancient world and so on but we will come back to that in a moment those are the two exams I don't tend to look at classical art we did this one year and it was not well received by students they didn't seem to have such an interest in it it just didn't take off to be completely honest now that may be down to perhaps teacher bias it's not my real forte if I'm to compare that to my my love and passion of, say, warfare and society, but it didn't take off. So we tend to leave that exam out and just have 1.1 and 1.3. During the year, we do two internals, which are called internals or assignments, which also gain credits. We look at one for social relationships. Now, for that one, we actually use the Odyssey again, and we look at you know father and son. So you might look at um, Odysseus, um, Odysseus and Telemachus. You might look at um, husband and wife, Odysseus and Penelope. You might look at men with their soldiers all different relationships within the text. The 1.5, the cultural links, is a very popular internal. And that one is where basically you're looking at how the ancient world links through into the modern. Now, for that one, we actually look and we compare the ancient myth of Heracles with the Disney movie Hercules. And we see what things survive across and what things, which of course is most of the case for this one, what things don't survive across. And it's, it recreates a lot of lively discussion around the original Heracles and the values and ideas that teaches us and what it shows us of the ancient world and the audience and we compare that to Disney Hercules and why is it so very different and how are we different and how do we see that in the text. So that's the different options that you cover in level one and as I said most schools will choose two exams so two externals and two internals. Most will leave out one of the standards somewhere. I leave out the classical art for myself. If you want to know more about them I've put the link down the bottom there that's the NCA link Click on that and it will take you to all the different standards. If you want to know more specifically or if the website's a bit too clunky, you're welcome to email me anytime if you're curious. So our standard is the 1.3 standard, the important or significant figure standard. We have this in level one and again at level three. So for level one, most schools tend to cover Cleopatra, Julius Caesar or Nero, and there are some that do Pericles, although not as commonly. So I would say if I'm looking at a sort of spread of the schools of New Zealand, the vast majority, I would say somewhere over the 60-70% mark do Cleopatra. She's a po popular choice because she's of course well written about, she's a female character which is a lot of focus on currently, there's a lot of discussion to be had. Julius Caesar is quite popular but then a lot of people do him at level two um, if they look at say the Battle of Actium or if they look at the rise of Octavian, Julius Caesar comes into that. Nero is also a popular choice, again, well written about, well versed, an easy figure to cover. As far as I've seen across New Zealand, no one had ever done Leonidas. So when I began this year, in which I took over the classics department at my school, the first change I made was to change my significant figure from the current Nero to Leonidas. And I did that for a few different reasons. Um, briefly, very, very briefly, the first reason would of course be my own personal interest. I think Sparta is massively interesting and I'm passionate about studying it further and of course understandably if a teacher loves a subject they will of course teach it much better so there was my own personal desire but beyond that Leonidas is a figure that is easy for students to study because there's not tracts and tracts written about him he's easy to read on so unlike Nero or Cleopatra 
with Leonidas, all we have is, you could say Herodotus has got a little bit in there. We could have a look at Xenophon's on Sparta. There's the Plutarch's sayings, but there's not a lot to read. And that means I can spend more time with my students going in depth into what we're looking at. I also chose Leonidas because I'd noticed that a lot of my units had to be had become very sort of ethnocentric as such. It was all about Athens, 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 Athens being the centre. And I wanted to give the obvious comparison. Like I tell my students very much, um, like Plato tells us, the Greeks are like frogs around a pond. They're, they're not all the same. They're all quite different. They're not all united. And I wanted to make that clear by having at least one unit where I say, the Spartans are Greeks, but they're not like the rest of the Greeks. Here is how they're different. So it was a really popular choice, and it's one that my students really enjoyed it. When I've asked them as to why they've enjoyed it, of course, the final reason I've come up for why I did my choice is because he's a lot in popular culture. He's up in the recent, I think it's the Assassin Creed, Assassin's Creed game. We see him in films like 300, which we do watch in class and compare to the actual story. We see him quite often. He's kind of everywhere. So he's a really... Fabulous choice, I've found. I've really enjoyed teaching him. Granted, it's only been the first year running it, and there will be changes made. It has been a very enjoyable course for my important figure. I'm hoping that other teachers will jump on board. I'm going to be emailing out my units to a few of the teachers end of this year and see if others want to jump on and collaborate. But we'll just see how we go, because of, as I can see there, the usual figures are pretty popular. So this is the achievement standard for NCA for 1.3 significant or important figure to achieve uh, achieved merit excellence. So like I said before, kind of look at that as like a C, a B, and an A as such. Achieved C, B, around merit, and A for excellence. What the student has to do then, if you're looking at the excellence category, as I would tell my students, is they've got to just demonstrate a perceptive understanding of a historical, important historical figure in the classical world. They've got to show the nature of their power, the relationships they held, any response to an event and how they showed leadership. These are the main themes or points they have to cover. So when I started creating my Leonidas unit, these were the themes I focused my unit around to make sure that I was approaching the standard. So what that means is that when the students sit down to the exam, the examination questions will be around those themes. They will ask questions to write an essay on around leadership, event, relationships. The questions every year are quite different, but they'll focus on those themes. So to best prepare my students, it makes sense to follow those themes, which I'll dive into a bit more in a moment. So in essence, the 1.3, all they need to really do is explain how a figure is important to the classical world, what they teach us about the classical world, their ideas, their traditions, their values, how they led, and so on. And for some students also to then consider how that's impacted us later on today. But this is a particular achievement standard that we're focusing on. So when I started creating my Leonidas unit, the first job I had, and this was actually during the first COVID lockdown in New Zealand, so it was um, a tricky time, but the first job I had was to try and figure out how to narrow down everything I wanted to cover about ancient Sparta and Thermopylae and Leonidas himself into a streamlined unit, because I realistically only have approximately five weeks to cover, everything needs to be covered, and then of course I need practices for the exams, and we can revise again later. So it's around five to six weeks of lessons. On average, each, less, each week we have around five lessons, I would say, one double and then four others, but it depends on the week. Of course, this is a high school and time can be cut by sports events and so on, so I have to be very efficient with my time. So the first thing I want to do was to break this down into themes. The first thing, of course, being, um, if you're looking at the left over here, is looking at the battle itself being the actions, because one of the themes we're given is events. So obviously we have to cover the Battle of Thermopylae, that's a given. The other thing was a trickier one, um, and it's one that I steer my students away from for the most part, and that is relationships. So we can look at Leonidas and his wife Gorgo. We can look at him and his um, co-king um, Leotides. We can look at him and the Spartan society around him. But there's not many relationships. They simply don't write a lot about the other figures. Um, even Leonidas is not much written about. So I do tell my students to steer somewhat clear of those essay questions. The last theme is, of course, an easy one, beliefs and values. For that, we can look at the upbringing in Sparta, the belief system, the government system, religious views. It's rich with evidence for us to look into, whether we're looking at the assembly, the ecclesia, the gerousia, whether we're looking at the agoge system. Whatever we're looking at, there's a lot to talk about with Sparta, particularly in a comparison to, say, the more Athens-type societies. So that's a really easy one for us to look at. On the right, you can see my sort of plan of attack of how I was going to attack this unit. So I started off by looking first of all at geography and early history and society of Sparta. Now, 
this was one that perhaps did not need to be included as far as being in the exam goes, but I am all for maps and I am all for understanding where a person or a place fits into the world in their context. So I didn't want to just start with Leonidas and get running because of course the Sparta that we're looking at has, has grown over quite a long time. So we, we delve a little bit into early geography, um, the Mycenaean Wars a little bit, at times I may take, take tangents off and look at the existence of an early Spartan cavalry, but that's just my own problem there. Um, we have a look at their early society, how they change, the kings, the different king lines. But although it's not assessed, I did find that students were really interested in this early stuff. They really did jump on board. I thought perhaps it might be a bit too verbose in areas and a bit too difficult because it is difficult for children of level one, but they loved it. They really jumped on board and we got through a lot more than I thought we would. The next thing we look at is Leonidas's early life. So with this, we look at, of course, um, his birth. So looking at his father having two wives um, and the, the issues that that would lead to and how that was quite rare. We look at the agoge system and the upbringing that Leonidas would have had, although um, um, his brothers and so on. Um, that was quite interesting again as well. Um, we talk quite a bit about uh, choosing who was going to be the king, whether it be Cleomenes or Leonidas. We look at his brother Darius, um, the one who got a big huff and decided to go um, try and colonize in Africa and failed and then tried to colonize in Sicily and was told that he will, um, if I remember rightly, the, the Delphic Oracle said to him, he will be settled there forever. And he was because he died there and was left there, of course, to be buried. Uh, we look at his upbringing and how that would have been. And we touch on a lot of the values and beliefs here. They actually come in quite early. We look at the way the government is set out. We look at the helot tree, the perioikoi. It all sort of comes in here. Then we very briefly touch on, for no more than a lesson really, the relationships he has with others. Now, for that one, we do look at Gorgo. The girls in particular got really excited about having a strong sort of female figure to look at. But again, there's not a lot about her. We have Herodotus writing a little bit about her, um, the reading of the, the missive that came from Demaratus when he was over in exile and how she understood the, the message that came. But we can look at other um, sayings from the to Spartans, Plutarch has in his sayings, um, sayings from women, which are really interesting, but there's not really a lot of ground for exams. This is more out of interest. After Gorgo, we do have a look at the relationship with his co-king, um, Leotides. This one I look at as an example of, I suppose I disagree a bit with Plutarch. Um, Plutarch, and more recently, I believe it was Victoria Friars came out to say that um, all Spartan kings were sort of heroes, and he is my example of no, not really. That, that's not quite actually actually quite right. I mean, if we look at him, um, he lived, reigned for a very long time, but in the end, he was found guilty of bribery and exiled. And we can look at also, I suppose, Cleomenes, who didn't face the best end either. Um, he put out the rumor that Demaratus was not of noble birth and that he should be exiled. And when it was found that Cleomenes had lied, he was dragged into prison and then died, perhaps murdered, murdered by a helot, perhaps he killed himself. We're not really sure, but these were were kings who were clearly not heroes. So I sort of use it as a springboard to discuss that again, coming back to our standard, Leonidas is important because he was a heroic Spartan king. Not all of them were heroic in the slightest sense. Some of them were, some of them weren't. Um, other relationships we look at, we look at the general Spartan populace, how he would have worked with the Spartiates, how he would have worked along with the Perioikoi, with the Helotri. There's a bit there, but it's more interest and padding for beliefs and values rather than an actual theme on its own. In week four, we dive headfirst into belief, beliefs and values. Um, there's so much to cover here, and it was so hard to narrow down, but we try to value it, or sorry, we try to, try to break it down into um, a few different groups. We look at the military excellence beliefs and value system, of course, that being the Agoge system and so on. We look at piety and religion, like the Artemis Orthia. Um, my students love the image of the um, there's a statue from the grounds of Sparta of Aphrodite, but she's dressed in armor. And we look at, you know, that sort of side of religion. And we look at how traditional and so on they were. Um, we look at austerity, the, the idea that, of course, you Spartans live a very Spartan life as such. And the last one that we tend to look at is service to the state. So giving up yourself for the state. We sort of break it into those four themes and focus in on those. But there is so much ground to cover. Week five is, of course, the big one, Thermopylae, the Battle of Thermopylae, what happened, why did it happen, some of the more colourful stories that come into it. We look at maps and we, we look at modern authors. Um, I found Ian Morris was an easy read for my students for this one. Cartledge's 2018 lecture 
um, was a really good one here. They enjoyed that. And a lot of them now know how to write, you know, that we have to um, penetrate the mirage of Sparta, quote from Cartledge. They all quite enjoyed that. The Thermopylae unit, or part of this unit, is the crux of it, the interesting part. Um, it's also a good chance for us to pause and have a look at our ancient sources at this point. And this is where I took a quite interesting diversion away and we read Xenophon's on Sparta and I taught my students how to look at ancient sources and how to read them and how to search through them. We had a chance to look at some Tertius fragments, um, different poetry, which they really enjoyed. I had some particularly overzealous students who were happy to perform some of them, which was entertaining. If you know your Tertius, you'll know why that is. Um, and we, we had a look at some of the modern sources as well. And of course, Herodotus. Well, Herodotus, because it's quite a large text, I went through mostly book seven and so on and pulled out the bits they needed and we talked about them. But it gave us a really good time to really look at ancient evidence. And again, coming back to my earlier slide, this is why I chose the Anitis. There's so much depth we can get that you can't gain with Cleopatra or Nero or our bigger figures because there's not as much to read. There's not as much to cover. You can get far deeper into the topics. Okay, so I suppose I've already covered a fair bit of this, but it does give you an idea of, of my early thoughts and how I planned on attacking each of these different areas, just to give you a bit more of an idea of how we went through each of them, so the Mirage of Sparta and the societal structure and the different authors that we look at, particularly the ancient authors. I really find it quite concerning that by the time we get some students to level three at other schools, they haven't read ancient sources, and if they have, it's just been cherry-picked by their teachers and they really need to get to know their ancient sources and know their ancient authors and think about bias. We talk about Xenophon and his sons going to Sparta and the fact he was a cavalryman and why his views on Sparta were as they were and we have a look at Herodotus and ask what his views might have been and how interesting it is that he goes and writes about a woman like Gorgo in such a positive way and why he might have done that and we read Tertius and what was he but his bias and there's a lot here to unpack and there's a lot to cover and if you're looking over the red boxes on the right there you can kind of get an idea of of where my class goes and the different sort of bits that we look at. But of course, there is so much more to it than what's on there because the class and the teaching is an organic process and we sort of move with it as it goes. You know, some classes will enjoy more things than others. This class really was resistant with mapping. They weren't really interested in looking at where the different cities in ancient Greece were. If you looked at my year 13s, we've just finished studying um, Alexander the Great. They loved mapping. For them, mapping, of course, told a story. They loved it. So we had a giant map on the board. This course next year might be quite different. I might have students who prefer completely different things. And it can be shifted and moved to each class and what they prefer. And if the standards for NZQA move, we can shift things around. But this is generally how it's been looking thus far this year. And it's been really successful. The feedback I've had from students is that they've enjoyed it. It has fit well to the standards. And my grades thus far, as we'll see soon, have been really positive. So that's fantastic. Okay, so... Here are the questions from two exams, oh, sorry, the last exams from 2018 and 2019 for this standard. So if you're looking down the, at the top there, 2019, those are the four questions that students can choose one of which to answer as an essay. And what I've done is you can see on the right, there's some themes colored. These are the main themes that have to be covered for the standard, the event, beliefs and values, relationships and leadership. And I've put the colors to which question it fits most strongly. Of course, there's a lot of gray areas. And then we go through as a class and say, right, what questions could we answer and with what evidence and so on? Which questions fit and what questions don't? So with question one, describe in detail an individual group, challenge the, the authority of the classical historical figure, in what ways was this figure successful or not in maintaining power in response to this challenge? So we're looking at leadership and power and we're looking at relationships. This one is not the easiest question for Leonidas. You could, of course, look at the challenge of Persia, the group, against say Leonidas and so on, and you could look at his leadership, but one that I'd usually steer my students away from. Number two is very, very easy for us to write on. Describe in detail one or more beliefs held by a classical historical figure and the actions they took as a result. In what way did these actions enable the figure to change or challenge the classical society? This is an easy one to talk about. Spartan beliefs and value systems, as we've already looked at, we cover the, the four big groups, our militarism, piety, austerity, and service to the state. They can dive into two or three or even four of those in their essay and talk about how Leonidas followed those and what actions he used to follow them. So whether it's consulting with an oracle and listening to it, unlike his brother, um, whether it's um, listening to the ephors and only taking the 300 with him rather than the entire army due to Carnea, whether it's his upbringing, all of these things can go into here. 
Number three is another relationship question. So this year they had two quite relationship-driven questions. A significant relationship between a historical figure and an individual, and in which way that affect classical society. This is a tricky one. I would say nigh impossible to do well for a year 11 student in the exam, because again, with Leonidas, we have a, a little bit, but with those around him, we have almost nothing. And not, not worthy of an essay at this level anyway. So again, for them, I say relationships, stay away. Don't do a relationship question. Stick to beliefs, values, leaderships, and event. The event is, of course, going to be easy with Thermopylae. And you can use relationships as evidence elsewhere or to add context, but not as the actual crux of your question. The last one um, would have been a popular choice for last um, 2019 if we'd had this topic, and that was describe in detail classical historical figures' response to an event and how that either reflects or challenges traditional views of leadership. That's, of course, a straightforward one. They'd look at Thermopylae and what, he, what Leonidas is showing by going to Thermopylae, his militarism, his service to the state, and so on. The year before that, very much the same sort of structure. Relationship question at the top there, a leadership question afterwards, um, a historical figure's response to a crisis, that's your event question, and then down the bottom is another sort of event and leadership twisted question. So you can see that with NCA, the questions are different every year, and no doubt they'll be different again this year. I won't see them until the students do, but they fit around those themes, and the students need to shape what they've learned to fit around those themes. Hopefully with my class, I've had drilled into them. They don't go near the relationships question. Instead, they focus on beliefs and values because that's brilliant for Sparta and Leonidas. They focus on the event because, again, we remember Leonidas because of his event, because of Thermopylae. Or we look at his leadership and power because he was a heroic king of Sparta, unlike others who were not quite so successful in their leadership of Sparta. Having a look at those questions, though, it does give you an idea. If you want to see more examples of questions or how the answers have been given, have a look at that NZQA site I put up earlier. I think it's on slide two or three. Or flick me an email and I can direct you to where they put up exemplars of essay questions each year. However, the responses you would get off NZQA will not be about Leonidas because, again, as far as I can find any evidence for, no other teacher in New Zealand has yet done Leonidas. So they'll be on Cleopatra, Julius Caesar and Nero. But they're still there if you're interested. So as a class, organically, whenever you teach a topic, questions come up. Big questions, big ideas, big decisions. And some of these questions are questions I want to pose to the class, which I have in mind from the start, and others come up as you go along. They organically sort of happen. These are some of the big questions that we've covered sort of as a class, where there have been debates, discussions, where they've just cropped up and become sort of a war between different kids in the class. These are big things we've covered. So, of course, the very first question has to be the world of Leonidas and how that impacts his decision. What makes him Leonidas? What makes him decide to go to Thermopylae? What makes him decide to lay down his life? What makes him different to other Greek city-states who will turn around and say, no, this is a dumb idea, we'll die, let's not do that. What makes him who he was? And we, we can look at the beliefs and the value system, um, we can look at the agoge system, we can look at his upbringing, all of that falls into there. We also have a look at what makes Leonidas special. What makes him an important and unique Spartan figure? He is not, as I said earlier, like other Spartan kings, he is quite unique. He is different to the rest of them. And why is he different? What has he done differently? With Thermopylae, always lots of discussion. Did they win or did they lose? Well, define a win, define a loss. Did they go to, did they get what they achieved, what they want to achieve or not? This one leads to some really interesting debates with my classes because, of course, you've got to define what is a loss and what is a win. What would you consider worth doing and what is not worth doing would Leonidas have considered this a loss as my next question would say or would he have been like actually that's what I went out to achieve and I achieved it there's a lot to look at here a simple google search online will take you to a myriad of modern articles from um, classic classicists and from people who are simply interested around whether or not this battle was worth going to and whether it was a win or a loss was it a pyrrhic victory whatever it was there's a lot of interesting debate and it's great to see my students really thinking about this about Leonidas' choice and why did he want to do this and was it worth doing and was it what he wanted and did he win or did he lose and does that really even matter? A lot to talk about there. Is Leonidas relevant is an interesting one that I ask my students. Does he matter? If he didn't, then why are we looking at him in 2020 New Zealand? Of course he must be relevant. How is he relevant? What can we gain from him? And that leads on to my next question that we discuss as a class and that is the surviving symbols and what can happen with those symbols? And in particular, we look at the uptake of the Molon Lave symbols. They come and take them um, by the far right. One of my students actually went um, whilst they were traveling, must have been 2019, over the summer through the States. They came back and they got some patches from a, um, 
an army type store, I suppose you would call it, which had Molon Labe on them, that whole come and take them idea. And we discussed that rise of the far right and how they take on those symbols of, of, of come and take them and Leonidas sort of as to support their own ideals and where that's right or wrong and why that might be. Um, it's, it's a really interesting discussion and it lends itself to so many other historical symbols and images and leaders and how they're used by others and so on. We also look at Leonidas and his films and games. Um, this one's been really interesting, particularly with the recent um, coming out of the Assassin's Creed game. And there's, of course, Sparta included. Um, I only saw a few weeks ago, actually, there's been a new discussion uploaded by a, an author. I completely forget his name. I apologize if you want to know, flip me an email. But he has put out a talk around the geography of Sparta in this game and where the different buildings are and how we know so little, but they've tried to do the best they can. We look at that game itself. We, of course, look at the movie 300, and that's really popular. Um, the kids love watching that and discussing you know, how much it's been changed. We've got the comic book as well. Why have they changed the story? What's been included? What's not been included? How is it different? How is it the same? And there's a lot of discussion to have there. The last one, of course, is Is Thermopylae Relevant in 2020 New Zealand? And I tend to divide the class in half, yes and no, and then let them sort of basically fight it out. And that one it, it is interesting. It brings up a lot of real thinking with the class of Auckland, New Zealand, 2020. Do we need to know about this? What does it teach us? What do we learn from it? What does it echo back to us from 2,500 years ago? Do we really care or not? And for the most part, we find that, yes, there's a lot to, of course, take and to learn from Thermopylae. There's a lot to gain from the character of Leonidas, more than just, say, I was on the right there, the Belgian chocolates that have been named after Leonidas. There's more to him than just that. These are some of our big questions. There are plenty more, but it gives you an idea. These are my assessment results so far. One of the practices from June to give you an idea and then another practice in August. Our real exams take place in about three weeks. So I don't have those results as yet, but I was really thrilled to see a growth in that excellence um, and a shift towards sort of the higher grades, which is fantastic. And I hope to see that continued. If you'd like to see my later results, flick me an email and I'm happy to tell you what we get. I won't get those probably until January of next year once the marking process has been completed, but I'm happy to share. These last two slides, I'll let you have a flick through on your own. Basically, I asked my students if they wanted to tell me something about the course. And this, and I gave them a big survey to answer and said, tell me, you know, do you think this was worth learning about? Did you enjoy this unit? And I've cut and pasted just some of the different quotes from students. Most of the students were happy for me to include their names. Some of them rather that I didn't. Um, so I've just put anonymous. My first one there by Lockie is one of my top students. He is a bit fabulous. I couldn't cut down what he said, but I've just copied and pasted verbatim some of my students' thoughts and what they sort of have gained from this unit. So you're welcome to have a flick through over those two slides and to see what they're gaining from it, what they're learning from it. I suppose the final point to make then is to consider how I'm going to change this unit as of next year. Now, I will, of course, be changing it and altering it and shaping it to fit every year. But the biggest thing I have to be looking through is that level one may indeed be cut. There might not be a level one in a few years. So I've got to look at how this unit might perhaps become one at level three or how I could shift it to fit a different part of the course because it has been very popular. One thing I have decided is that I need to bring in more modern sources. I've got your standard um, cartilage, of course, and I've got Morris, as I mentioned earlier, but I'd like to bring in some more modern sources as well. The difficulty with that is it needs to be user-friendly for my students. The other part I'd like to have a look on is perhaps shifting away from early Sparta. I think I spent a bit too much time on that. The class enjoyed it, but I found at the end we were rushing to get ourselves finished. So I would perhaps look at shifting the emphasis away from early Sparta and more into later modern relevance, reception of the hero of Leonidas, more looking at later statues and um, iconography and symbols, giving ourselves a bit more time for that. However, this is the last week of school. I'm running one more survey with my students and I'm going to be seeing what they would like to see changed. Having asked them as a class verbally, what would you like to see changed? For the most part, they're very positive. They really enjoyed the course, which is fantastic. Their essays and practices show me they've learned a lot. What they can tell me shows me they've learned a lot, which of course is very rewarding as a teacher. As far as changes go, all they can tell me is that they want more. But of course, time doesn't really allow for that. So maybe I'll get something different out of it. So I hope you've gained something out of listening to what we do down here in New Zealand at the very bottom of the globe, looking at Leonidas, which is pretty far away from where it all happened. If you want to know more about what we learn and what we do, 
if you want more photographs of the awesome shields we've been making, like on my very opening cover slide, or if you want to see the pottery we're doing or anything at all, flick me an email and I'm happy to share. I've got plenty of resources if you'd like to see the, the sheets we use or the PowerPoints we learn from or how we do our teaching and learning. I am more than happy to collaborate. Just flick me an email anytime and I'm happy to share. So I hope you've all gained something and enjoy the rest of this course.